All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the second installment of the Piedmont Environmental Council's quarterly keynote series. My name is Kendra Atkins and I'm a development assistant at PEC. So before we get into the presentations, I just wanna quickly go over a few housekeeping items. So first, this webinar is being recorded and a link of that recording will be made available after the event. Uh, second, there will be time allotted at the end for a quick Q&A session, so please feel free to type any questions you may have into the chat, and we will do our very best to answer as many of those as possible. Finally, your microphones are muted, and they will stay muted throughout the entire presentations just to avoid any disruptions. So without any further delay, I'm very excited to introduce one of our hosts for this evening's event, Jessica Kachilong. So earlier this year, Jessica signed on as the new executive director for Shendo National Park Trust, and she and her team have been working with us to help us plan this event that you're enjoying this evening. So Jessica, thank you for joining us, and I will pass it along to you to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Kendra. It's such a pleasure to be here with you guys this evening, and I look forward to an opportunity when we can all meet in person again. Aren't we all over Zoom? I'm getting there, um, particularly on a night like this. Uh, as Kendra mentioned, I am the new executive director of the Shenandoah National Park Trust, and the trust uh, supports the work that goes beyond what the National Park Service can accomplish on its own, enabling improvements, critical research, enriching visitors' experiences, and leveraging private dollars to help the park meet its conservation mission, ensuring that the Shenandoah National Park remains the crown jewel of the National Park Service. Um, tonight, our first speaker this evening is the superintendent of the Shenandoah National Park, Pat Kinney. Pat has been the superintendent of the Shenandoah National Park and Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historic Park since October 2020. Big job there, Pat. Um, he is a 31 veteran of the National Park Service. And prior to coming to Virginia, Pat has served in a variety of roles for the National Park Service, including the most recently the deputy superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, superintendent of Cape Lookout National Seashore, and the planning branch chief for the National Park Service. Pat will present on public and private land conservation and their ecological, economic, and recreational values. Uh, next up after Pat will be Dr. Amy Johnson, the program director of the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute's Virginia Working Landscape, or VWL. Um, VWL is a research initiative that promotes conservation of native biodiversity and sustainable land use through education and community engagement. In her role with VWL, Amy cultivates a network of private land over, landowners, citizen scientists, research scientists, and public organizations to collectively investigate the impacts of conservation management and land use on biodiversity. This evening, she will share with, with us some of the findings the VWL team has uncovered through scientific studies happening in the Piedmont and how we are working together to turn those results into conservation action. And finally, you will hear from longtime PEC President Chris Miller. Since 1996, Chris has led the PEC and the communities they serve through some major challenges and threats to the Piedmont, including Disney's America Development Proposal. Today, PEC works to address land conservation, habitat restoration, rural economics, energy policy, land use policy, and food security across a nine county region. Chris tonight will provide us with an overview of how all of these topics and the work of PEC, the park and VWL tie together for, for a holistic understanding of conservation efforts happening throughout the Piedmont. I wanna thank all three of you wonderful speakers for joining us tonight. And of course, to all of you, more importantly for joining us. Uh, your support of our three organizations enables us to do the work that makes the Piedmont a great place to visit, live, work, and play. And now I'll turn it over to you, Pat. Um, thank you, Jessica. Uh, it's great to have such a great partner like Shenandoah National Park Trust um, and, a, and a great executive, new executive director like Jessica to help uh, facilitate the mission of the Park Service. Um, it's a real pleasure to be joining all of you this evening. As a, as a new Virginian uh, and uh, being stationed here at Shenandoah National Park. Um, it's a great resource. It's a great park. We're very lucky that uh, some people that were smart back in the day created this park uh, so that we all can enjoy it, enjoy it. It's a great effort in land conservation that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen, bear with me for a moment.
And if somebody can just confirm that you're seeing it, that'd be great. Yep, looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so land conservation, why is it important? Um, you know, uh, I'm biased. I work, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to have one snafu. So first of all, what is land conservation? I'm obviously biased. I've spent most of my adult life in the, in the arena of preserving public lands, but land conservation goes beyond public lands. And so just kind of a simple definition, something to, to kind of ground us in what we're talking about. It's the act of protecting natural lands and or uh, returning those lands to a natural state. I mean, Shenandoah is a great example of returning lands to a natural state. Um, when those lands were uh, acquired for, to create the park, uh, they had been worked, uh, they had been timbered, they had been mined. And, and over the years, conservation has moved them to restore the, the forest and, and various functions of the forest. So, you know, a little bit about why do we care about land conservation? I, I kind of put it into four buckets. Uh, you know, we could probably slice and dice this many ways. Some of you may have your own thoughts on this, but I kind of brought it for tonight's presentation. We're going to talk about the ecological values. We're going to talk about the recreation values, the economic values, and, sort, and a category that I called well-being, and I'll touch on that a little bit more. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm obviously biased towards public lands. I've, as, I, as Jessica mentioned in my bio, uh, I am a public land manager. I have been for 31 years. Um, so, and that's, that is land that is owned by a governmental agency in my mind. It is open to the public. It was bought for the good of the people. Uh, sort of like National Parks, U.S. Fish and Wildlife manages the wildlife refuge system. Uh, we have national forests. There is, a, there is a piece of that puzzle there that was put together, you know, at some point in our time, people, our, our policymakers, our decision makers decided these lands should be protected and set aside. Those are the public lands. Uh, but I will just touch on a few things about private lands. Um, you know, one, a lot of the large tracts of land uh, that were set outside as public domain lands or public lands have been, have been conserved. But oftentimes they're not large enough or um, these lands, uh, these private lands along public lands can, can serve as conductivity uh, points uh, for wildlife to transfer. Jessica mentioned I worked at Yellowstone. It's 2.2 million acres. It's a pretty large chunk of real estate. It's bigger than Rhode Island and Delaware put together. It still wasn't big enough for some of the ungulates, uh, large roaming ungulates like elk and bison uh, because it was a lot of higher elevation land and uh, those wildlife needed winter range and they moved outside the park. Those lands that were in conservation outside the park became critical. It's very similar here in Virginia. Uh, from my perspective in Shenandoah, the highlands were protected as part of the park. The Valley and the Piedmont uh, are private lands. Those lands offer connectivity for wildlife, uh, fisheries move through them, uh, things like that. So we're to, it's important to think about conservation of lands, both public and private. So again, I want to touch on my what I categorize the values. And again, there's many ways to look at the value of land conservation. Um, these, I'm sure uh, you all have your other own thoughts on that, but these are these are just some thoughts that I put together for tonight. So let's talk about the ecological benefits. I know Amy's going to do a deeper dive on this, but I think uh, I want to just touch on it. Obviously, uh, there's fish and wildlife habitat. You know, things like the the American black bear are, are couldn't survive without the conservation of lands. Um, you know, we have fisheries such as brook trout that start in the highlands of Shenandoah National Park, move through the Piedmont and out, you know, and ultimately uh, that water flows to the Chesapeake and, and supports fisheries out there. But I think, you know, that's important from fish and wildlife conservation. Uh, these lands also protect our water quality. Um, that's important for us as humans, but it's important for this earth. You know, it, it helps with air quality. It helps in, in, in buffering climate change to have forests that are sequestering carbon and things along those lines. And again, others in this panel are gonna talk deeper on the ecological benefits. Uh, an area that is extremely important these days is recreation. Um, public lands and private lands provide recreational opportunities. 
It can be passive things like just the aesthetics and the view sheds, sitting on our front porches in, in, the, in the areas that surround Shenandoah National Park, provide that view of the park. Um, to me, there's a recreational component, just that enjoyment of it. Uh, the vistas that we see from Skyline Drive. There's the more active recreational opportunities that we public and private lands present, hiking and camping, bicycling. You know, we have hunting and fishing that are great recreational opportunities on these lands. Economics, and this cannot be understated. Um, I'm gonna bring this up a little bit and just talk about the National Park Service. It's something I, I know quite well. Uh, there are 423 units of the National Park Service in all 50 states and the US territories. Um, we just completed a study, released a study uh, from 2020. Of those units, uh, there were 237 million visits to those units of the National Park Service in 2020. Uh, $14.5 billion were spent by visitors within a 60 mile radius of those parks. Um, that equates to about $28.6 billion contribution to the national economy and 234,000 jobs were created coming off this uh, from that. Um, you know, bringing it down to Shenandoah, there was a, in 2020, we had 1.6 million visits. Uh, the economic impact to that, to the region, again, 60 mile radius coming out from the park is $107 million. About 1,300 jobs were created from that. So there's definitely an economic benefit to having lands conserved. Um, you know, on private lands, I'm not as well versed in that topic as others are, uh, but there's obviously benefits to the landowner for conservation. Um, there are benefits to your, your neighborhoods and things like that from that conservation. So I think our economic impacts as well for private lands being conserved. The final category, as I put it, was called well-being. And, you know, there's been a lot of cutting edge research in, in recent times relating to this. Um, you know, some of this work started in the Far East. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a concept that, that came out of Korea called forest healing. Um, the the uh, spending time in forest uh, in, in Korea was cypress forest, and they, they evaluated the biological and physio physiological changes that were going on in humans as we spent time in these forests, and they showed correlations to uh, 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 better health and th uh, things along that line. Um, there's work being done in Idaho right now with uh, Iraqi uh, veterans and uh, how spending time on the rivers in Idaho is beneficial to them in addressing issues related to PTSD. There's been work in West Virginia uh, with kids uh, dealing with ADHD um, and, and how this, the impacts of, of benefits of being, uh, spending time in a natural environment. And it's amazing to me that if just, I mean, I was out in the park today and just that you know, you feel so much better of being out there. You have the feel, you feel like you're more alive. Uh, I think this gentleman on this rock really sums it up. You know, you just want to be out there. Um, and I think it really came home uh, in the last 15, 16 months. Um, uh, you know, I think back uh, to February and March of, of last year and uh, this stuff of called COVID-19 uh, was being talked about. And ultimately, you know, we saw the, the beginnings of the, the pandemic spread across the United States. Um, national parks, especially big natural areas such as Shenandoah, experienced growth in visitation. Uh, we were up 15% over 2019 levels, which was already a big year. Um, people found well being, they, they found uh, uh, security, they found uh, safety, they found uh, a release from stress related from the pandemic. And I think these lands have value for that. I don't think we need a pandemic to make sure that they're valuable. However, I think they are really important for that. I think we come to these green spaces uh, to feel that, that strengthening of our creativity, that opening of our mind, uh, that healing of our soul, if you'll accept that term. I think it's important uh, for conservation. So I think, you know, just kind of a quick overview of why land conservation is important. 
Um, I think there's great ecological benefits for this. I think there's great recreational experiences out there for all of you to have. I think there's economic benefits of conservation. And again, there's this piece of well being that's out there. So I hope, and I know a lot of you are supporters of conservation of private and public lands. It is important uh, for this country. It is our heritage that gets conserved in some respects. Um, so I think it's really a, a great topic uh, to be talking about tonight. And I look forward to working with all of you again. Um, you know, I, I have to kind of go back to there are ways for all of you to support conservation. Uh, I think being here tonight is great. Um, you know, we have a great partner in the Shenandoah National Park Trust. Uh, they recently added a thousand acres of real estate. Uh, we're in the process of transferring it from the trust uh, to the park uh, called Tanner's Ridge. Uh, that effort wouldn't have happened. Uh, the federal government is prohibited from acquiring lands to add to the park. We can only accept them through donation. So the efforts of the trust were great in ensuring that, and we'll see that land transferred yet this year. Um, and then my other uh, colleagues, uh, the work of their organizations is, is remarkable uh, in this area as I get to know this area. So again, thank you very much. Uh, really a support, you're, you're really thankful for your support of land conservation. I'll turn it back to you, Jessica. Sorry, let me remember how to work my tools. And now I'll turn it over to Amy. Are you there, Amy? There you are. I'm here, yes. Uh, just gonna work on sharing my screen here. All righty. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I'll take that as a yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And so nice hearing from you, Pat, and it's, it's been great gearing up for this event with you. I look forward to, to meeting you in person soon. Um, I'd like to just start uh, my segment by, by drawing your attention to this photo um, on my title slide. This, this photo was taken on the top of Racetrack Hill at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. It's this, this epic hilltop where some of you actually may have gathered with us um, in previous years to celebrate our combined conservation efforts in the region. It has this endless view of, of rolling hills, a patchwork of public and private lands, as you can see. And, and then there's also these really up close interactions you get with the species that make these, these hilltop meadows um, so special. And, and all of this together just really reminds us of the many reasons we feel so fortunate to live in this place. And I think, I think the reason we value this landscape so much is because we know how much effort goes into protecting it. And, and we know that without effective conservation strategies, we could lose the diversity that keeps this region so special. So as program director for Virginia Working Landscapes, I lead a team that brings together scientists and landowners citizen scientists and regional partners to study and promote the management of Virginia's landscapes for native biodiversity. So we aim to monitor biodiversity throughout the region, better understand how management of our landscapes impacts biodiversity, and then work together with our partners to optimize opportunities for conservation that work for both people and the species that we share our landscapes with. So these are species like the Northern bobwhite quail who have declined by more than 80% in Virginia since the 1970s. Or the rusty patch bumblebee. This is the first bumblebee to ever be listed as endangered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and this is after surveys found that it had declined by nearly 90%. And even our region's native plants, like this, this Tories mountain mint that's pictured here. It's a beautiful herbaceous perennial that has been classified as imperiled at the national level and has disappeared from several of its native states. So these are just a few examples of Virginia's threatened species that our team at Virginia Working Landscapes has been monitoring right here in the region amongst our working landscapes. So why is this significant that we're documenting these species? Why is biodiversity important? 
and, and Pat covered this well already, but it's, it's really these, these living organisms of the region, these species that we share our landscape with are what we depend on every single day. So the diversity of species is what gives us our clean air, it filters our water, it replenishes our soils, it pollinates our food. And when just one species goes extinct, this cascading ripple effect occurs in an ecosystem, and this threatens all of the other species who depend on it. And an extinction doesn't even need to occur for this effect to take place. A, sh a sharp decline in a population of species can be almost as detrimental as extinction, just weakening an entire ecosystem. And then as the stresses of species loss increase, it only remains a matter of time until our ecosystems just reach a breaking point after which collapse becomes rapid and potentially irreversible. So in order to prevent this from happening, we need collaboration. Oh, my neighbor's flying by in his plane. <laughs> uh, we need public land managers to support our wild places, land trusts to build connectivity across private lands and the landowners to care for those lands. We need conservation ambassadors in our state and federal agencies, in our students that are in training, in our citizen scientists and our local NGOs that are leading community focused efforts but we also need science. We need science to build our understanding of our region's ecosystems, to learn about the species that rely on these habitats all around us, and also to help inform the collective conservation decisions being made across the region. So VWL is a program of Smithsonian's Conservation Biology Institute, where our team is based in Front Royal. We work with this vast network of scientists who contribute to the study of conservation literally all over the world, but that also includes right here in the Piedmont and Shenandoah Valley. So we've been relying on collaborations like the ones you're hearing about today to help us elucidate complex ecological questions that can help drive important conservation decisions. So for example, um, conservation scientists from um, the Conservation Ecology Center they recently collaborated with biologists at Shenandoah National Park to study the long-term impacts of invasive insects on our forests. Learning that invasive species are linked to over a quarter of forest biomass losses over the last few decades. So these invasive species, I have them pictured here. We've got the hemlock woolly adelgid here on the left uh, and effects of emerald ash borer here on the right. So collaborative studies like these can help us better understand responses of forest communities to rapid changes like this, and also identify appropriate measures and partnerships um, to mitigate impacts of invasives. Um, this study was funded by the Shenandoah National Park Trust. Another study that was led by some of my colleagues at Smithsonian who work with eMammal and the Changing Landscapes Initiative they also worked with Shenandoah National Park, our local landowners, as well as our VWL citizen scientists to deploy camera traps throughout the entire region. You can see where all of the deployments were. Um, and they did this to, to predict how our region's mammal species might respond to future land use changes. And these results found that several species like black bears and bobcats are highly sensitive to human development and habitat loss. So this really highlights the importance of our protected areas like Shenandoah National Park, like our conservation easements for biodiversity preservation in developing landscapes. So through VWL, we've been working with our team of citizen scientists in that exact same study region to study year round habitat associations of grassland birds. So this includes sites within Shenandoah National Park as well as properties held under easement with PEC. And over the last 10 years, we've been learning about how species are using different types of grasslands. So for example, we're finding much higher densities of these Eastern meadowlarks in agricultural fields. So our hay fields and our pastures, while we're finding higher densities of indigo buntings in native wildflower meadows. And our work doesn't stop 
in the winter, actually our most recent publication using the same study region helped identify mowing schedules that can help optimize conservation opportunities for species that overwinter in our region's grasslands. Like these short-eared owls we only see here in the winter, as well as American tree sparrows. Mm. So this season, we're working with multiple partners to unravel the mystery of Eastern meadowlark habitat use and migration using these tiny GPS backpacks. So these are about the size of the top of my pinky finger and they fit right on the back of a meadowlark, uh, just like a backpack. And then simultaneously, we're working with producers to study the nesting habits of meadowlarks and other grassland birds in both grazed and hazed fields to better predict how we can adjust management timing to recover their populations. So you'll see this, this photo of an eastern meadowlark nest. We just took this a week ago, and this is right in the middle of a 70 acre hay field that is being managed to maximize nesting success through this project. These nests are so vulnerable to disturbance from farm equipment, predators, livestock, and weather. So this research uh, is helping to bring light to how we can work with landowners and farmers to mitigate some of these threats. And having opportunities to collaborate with private landowners as well as our public land managers to conduct research like this is enabling us to create science-based management recommendations that can be applied on public and private lands throughout the region. So this graphic is part of a handout that's currently being shared with landowners in the region just to help demonstrate when grassland birds are most vulnerable to field management. Uh, and we're constantly updating this as new information is learned through our ongoing research. And these research opportunities also inspire new collaborations, like the recently launched Piedmont Grassland Bird Initiative, where partnering organizations are combining expertise in research, in land conservation, in regenerative agriculture, as well as wildlife habitat to stem the tide of grassland bird decline to improve the resiliency of our working landscapes and also to develop practices that work for both people and birds. So while many of these projects I'm referring to have been about species, about their, their distributions and their habitats, we can't forget about the people. Conservation can't happen without people putting in the effort. So that's why we've teamed up with social scientists at Virginia Tech to survey community members in the region, just to learn more about what is driving conservation, what motivates people to put their land under conservation easement, or to volunteer with habitat restoration on our public lands, or to plant pollinator meadows in their own backyards. Are we inspired by the actions of our neighbors? or by participating in citizen science programs, or are we inspired by, um, by the science itself? We've just completed a series of interviews and surveys that will help elucidate these questions so that collaborative partnerships like the ones you're hearing about tonight can refine our efforts to maximize our collective impact in the region. Because ultimately, that is what conservation is all about. It's about combining resources, combining expertise, and really lifting each other up as we reach for the same goal to ensure healthier, more resilient landscapes that can support our livelihoods and those of future generations for decades to come. So I'd like to end my segment with this fascinating animation of a male coyote we've been tracking with GPS technology. This coyote was tagged in late 2019 before COVID started on SCBI property as part of a collaborative study with some of my Smithsonian colleagues. And we're doing this really to learn more about how coyotes are using this mosaic of public and private lands so we can make more informed decisions about management. So you'll notice he, he stayed pretty local um, to the SCBI property for most of the year, with the exception of this spot right here. He went on down to Rappahannock Cellars one afternoon. Um, I'm sure 
others are familiar with an afternoon at Rappahannock Cellars. <laughs> but as the year went on, and I'll just fast forward a little bit, something, something shifted here. He shifted his movements and he began to venture out into this vast network of lands that spans the work of our three organizations. So this coyote visited easement properties. He hiked along Skyline Drive. He hunted in pastures and slept in forest patches. So I'm sure just watching this, some of you may be able to recognize some of the places he's visited along the way, which to me makes it all the more exciting um, just to be able to have real time science like this happening right here in the region. So while we may each be making our daily conservation decisions based on the properties we own and the properties we manage, we also need to recognize that we're all connected through this landscape and we all have an opportunity to ensure that our wildlife, including our birds, our, our bumblebees, our native wildflowers, and even our soils have the means to contribute to the overall health and resiliency of this incredible place. Supporting research programs like Virginia Working Landscapes can provide us and our partners with the knowledge to do just that. So I hope you'll join us by signing up your property for research projects or volunteering your time to our citizen science program or supporting our work and that of our partners through donations. So Chris will provide some more information on how you can go about doing that as he closes off our presentations. But in the meantime, um, you can check out our website to learn more. And I really look forward to the conversation at the end of the program. Thanks so much. I'll pass it back over to, let's see, Chris. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> great, great slides. I'm always so excited to watch your work on, on, on the screen and so glad to be a partner with you and Jessica. Oh, thank you. Likewise, Chris. Amazing friends to work with. So I'm going to try to provide uh, some context about just how much uh, each of you as, as nearby landowners and as supporters can, can help us accomplish and just how big an impact all that work has, has had over time. Um, and I'm just gonna switch over to some slides that I have. Um, and hopefully that'll help. Um, it takes a minute to do this. Yeah, good, can you see? If you could just go into yes. present mode. Oh, oh sorry, there you go. Yep, perfect, thank you, Chris. Yep. Always takes longer than you think. So this is an image we, we always like to start presentations with because our, our view of conservation is that it's a multi-generational effort. Uh, this is a group of our summer fellows um, who, who come and spend seven weeks with us learning about conservation in all of its forms and working with all of our partners. Um, last two years, we've had to do it virtually, but uh, we've got 14, participants from all over the country, including Virginia, and uh, remarkable kids. They're, they're really taking advantage of the opportunity, even though uh, they're not here to enjoy the landscape with us. So hopefully we'll be back, back with them um, in person next year. This is a map of, of public lands in America. Uh, it's an important image to start with because a lot of us uh, have heard about, about the incredible uh, resources of the federal government, state governments. A lot of that's concentrated in the West, um, in Alaska. And, and, and the, if the reality is east of the Mississippi, which involves this public-private partnership um, because most of the habitat is gonna be on private lands. Uh, this is uh, the region where PEC works. As you can see, it reaches into the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, the park is sort of the backdrop for, for our work and our partners in the Shenandoah Valley uh, uh, have a similar perspective. Uh, but 
to put it in, in, in the context, this is a, a map from the National Conservation Easement Database. Uh, it has every easement in the United States. And it'll show you sort of where private lands are, are added to that mix of public lands. Um, you'll see great concentrations in, in Montana and in, in, the, in the West around Yellowstone. In Colorado, where we have partners who've, who've done very similar work. And then in the Northeast and in the Mid-Atlantic. But as we zoom in, you'll see that the Shenandoah National Park is particularly uh, beneficiary of, of work of public-private partnership all around it. And, and what's, what's remarkable is the closer you get, the closer you look, um, the more you realize uh, that that private conservation is in fact connected. It's, it's creating contiguous, uh, continuous corridors uh, and, and large areas of conservation land that can provide the basis for uh, adaptive land management. Pat made a good point early on that the Shenandoah National Park represents one of the first uh, examples of, of recovering native landscapes from, from human um, management. Uh, the Shenandoah National Park when it was created was, was largely pasture, uh, it was heavily populated and, uh, and, and it represents one of the largest uh, restoration projects on the East Coast and with remarkable results. So what we are now doing is, is respecting private property ownership, trying to extend that conservation benefit into new areas and, and with the same degree of connectivity. Results are, are pretty astounding when you get up in the air. And we've got some images from, from a drone that we have trained one of our communication staff to use and fully certified by the FAA to fly in, in all these areas. Um, this, is, this is looking at the Robinson River as it comes out of the Shenandoah National Park in, in uh, Greene County. Um, here's a view from the park along Skyline Drive, uh, looking out. And that's important because much of what you see when you're in Shenandoah National Park uh, is lands outside of the park boundary. This is a map we created in partnership with the, with the park and with the, uh, the Shenandoah National Park Trust. Each of those black dots is the public view viewpoint. And what we're doing here in the, in the yellow areas is documenting the, the lands that you can see from those viewpoints. And so, uh, it's, you can see where the, the conservation of private lands becomes very important just for that, uh, that relaxation, that connection with the open space that, that Pat talked about earlier. Uh, that means working with landowners. Uh, some of you may recognize Cliff Miller. Uh, he's out in the field. Uh, and this is actually a work on, on pasture management with Mike Sands, but uh, at the point here is that when you look back the other direction, you're looking at the park, and these are the folks you have to work with uh, to, to, to get that big, big area of conservation. It's very hands-on. But the results over 50 years uh, have been astounding. Uh, this is a graphic where we combined all the land area from the different easements in the park, try to create a representative comparison. There's 195,000 acres in the park in the, on the Piedmont side of that boundary. There's about 426,000 acres now conserved on private land. And that is, uh, that's a really astounding result and tried to show you in several different ways how, how that adds up. This is more than, than, than 1,200 different families who've made the donation of, of a rather large portion of their family assets. And, and the, the, it's a very significant contribution to not only to the public, but to the goal of restoration and, 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 and preservation of our biodiversity, our view sheds, our history, uh, and our working lands. So what's next? Uh, we have an incredible opportunity in this area to, to continue to accelerate the rate of conservation and restoration. You know, from perspective of 30 years, I often get the question of, haven't we done it all? Haven't we taken all the low hanging fruit isn't it going to get harder as we go forward? And my answer is that every time someone has said that to me, something dramatic has happened to actually help conserve more land. And I think in the, the weeks and months and years to come, you'll find that we're far from done and that the, the process will continue. One of the reasons is we're starting to see an alignment between federal, state, regional, local, 
um, philanthropic perspectives, uh, resources, programs. We're better, our science is better. You, know, you can tell that we benefit from Amy's work. Uh, she, she provides an incredible uh, template and palette for what we need to be trying to accomplish. And that combined with more resources from, from every part of the society is really gives us an opportunity to move forward and to do something really special. Uh, Pat mentioned two projects. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica if she can get off, uh, get out and get onto uh, the microphone. This is one that he first one he mentioned, the Tanner Ridge Track. I just wanted to make sure she got a chance to tell you about that great project. Um, this, thank you, Chris. This is um, we're really excited about this. We actually just closed on this property in February and are hoping to uh, transfer this thousand acres over to the national park the Shenandoah National Park here in the next couple months. Um, and this actually borders, uh, as you can see from the map, it borders quite a bit of the park. Um, and it is ecologically important. It is uh, the Conser Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation rated it as having an outstanding ecological in integrity. And I think, you know, one of the really great things is that it it is connected to the only ecological core in Page County. So we're really connecting, you know, the South Fork to the Massanutten Range, which is, is very exciting. Um, and then we've also had the opportunity to um, purchase, or we are in the process of purchasing and hoping to um, acquire this land actually in the fall. It's at 225 acres. Um, in Browntown, Virginia. And it also is, um, you know, highly rated and by the Virginian. I'm going to get these right. I apologize. The Conserve Virginia, um, and it also um, has a lot of globally rare ecological community habitat. So we're just very excited to um, really focus on land conservation and sort of building out our park as much as possible. Well, that's great. And Jessica, the, the neat thing is, is that there are other projects I know you're working on, we're working on a couple. So, you know, building the capacity of the park is, is always part of what we're able to do over the years. We've been able to donate properties in the wilderness areas. We've got a couple of things we're, we're still trying to accomplish. And, and Pat, just be ready. Be ready to accept those. Yes, <laughs> we'll open on. One of the reasons that we're so excited is that this notion of trying to protect 30% of biodiversity lands and waters by 2030 is now a national goal. Uh, it's conceived, I think, by, by most of the national conservation organizations led by the Nature Conservancy. But it's been embraced by, by the, the, the federal government as a, as a concept. Uh, we're all working through what that really means, what are the details, but, but as a, an organizing principle, as a motivating concept, uh, I think that's that's the first time we've had a very clear declaration of that as a goal. Uh, it's really inspiring, and I think it's driving some thinking. This is this is a, a map of Conserve Virginia, which Jessica has referenced, and uh, it's an effort by the state to to put into one model and one map uh, some of its highest priority, the top ten percent. Uh, and you can see from this map that a lot of what we've been doing uh, around the park is consistent with those statewide goals, and so. As the state gains resources, uh, we're working on now dedicated revenue for conservation as a possible legislative initiative in the next General Assembly session. Uh, the state is considering putting some of the $4 billion it's receiving uh, in, as part of the COVID relief package into conservation, especially for public access. And so, you know, this having a, a, a common point of view and one that highlights uh, the same areas of conservation that we're targeting. Uh, is, is also very encouraging. I don't know if you can see my my, my uh, cursor, but you know here's here's the backdrop of the, of the of the park. Here's Charlottesville, just to give you reference, and you can see a lot of the target green areas are places that, that all, all of us uh, are doing work. This is actually the Rappahannock Upper Rappahannock Basin, where the Grasslands Initiative is targeted, trying to get folks that are involved in agriculture and working lands to better manage their properties for species diversity. Uh, another overlay is the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, which is federal, state, and local agencies and nonprofits working together to try to define a common goal within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. You know, this service area for PEC, the Shenandoah National Park, the Shenandoah Valley, 
or just a portion of this larger whole, uh, but very significant one and one that's being prioritized by uh, all these different organizations. We're at 22%, so that 30% by 2030 is very attainable. Uh, there's some new programs coming on at the federal level. Chesapeake Wild is one that I think Amy and I are particularly excited about because it brings new dollars from the federal government for habitat protection and specifically. Um, and, and so again, this is this alignment of, of resources to, to help towards a common goal is, is part of why we're so excited. Of course, we're, we're more ambitious than that. Uh, we actually have a million acre goal, um, which is about twice, twice where we're at today. It's about 50% of the, the land area. So far, we've protected about 427,000 acres on private land and added to the 125,000 acres of public lands. We're sort of halfway there. Um, but again, it, I think it gives you context for, for why uh, we're encouraged that this can go forward and, and be something that we all work together to, to attain. I just want to reference back to, to, to our work collaboratively with American Bird Conservancy, VWL, the, the uh, uh, American Farmland Trust, Soil and Water Conservation, Conservation Districts who work with the ag community. We've got a lot of partners and we're all trying to figure out the right mix of practices that maximize water quality, that help help improve habitat uh, while maintaining the ability to, to raise you know, food and, and fiber and things that, that, that we all enjoy. And so the, the grassland birds work we're gonna do together and going forward is, is, is real focus. But we've been doing some other things. Well, we, this is our charismatic megafauna. This is the endangered species of our region. It's the native brook trout. And where it does well, uh, the waters we love and, and, and that we need for drinking water, for recreation are doing well as well. Uh, so by focusing on, a, on an indicator species like brook trout, like the meadowlark, we can do uh, great things for habitat in general. Um, the Senandoah National Park provides a big backdrop for this work. Uh, it's the area that we've already restored and it's protecting uh, the source waters and the, and the core populations of the brook trout. What we're working on now is re reconnecting uh, the next, next layer of, of streams, uh, even, down to the, even down to the flatlands, although that tends to be too warm for specifically for brook trout. It still can provide uh, habitat for other native uh, bird species. Uh, this is a joint venture we, we were doing with uh, Trout Unlimited with the park, with hopefully with the Shenandoah National Park Trust going forward, and with a lot of help from, from local funders and partners. Um, we're trying to reconnect sections of stream that have been um, degraded from the barriers of public and private roads. We've mapped all of those, and now we're working on uh, moving from pilot projects to the broad uh, adaptation by both private landowners and by VDOT. Um, some of the results have been pretty dramatic and, and directly beneficial to the park. This is uh, the old crossing into the parking lot for White Oak Canyon, which is a very popular uh, entrance into the Shenandoah National Park, a great series of waterfalls. It was one of the worst barriers in, in the system and it was creating uh, a very isolated population. Uh, the project was to remove that uh, set of culverts and replace them with this, this wonderful bridge, uh, it improved access to the parking lot and to, to hiking, but it clearly had a benefit in terms of the habitat and the uh, free flowing streams uh, along, along that section uh, of the park. Uh, lots of partners from private landowner, Mr. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Graves, who runs Graves Mountain Lodge, uh, all the way through to our staff and the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, and the, the State Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, which is now Department of Wildlife Resources, and uh, the, the Madison County uh, government officials. Um, back in the corner there is Albert Spells, who, who, who dreamed up the whole project at US Fish and Wildlife and made a lot of this happen. So we, we, he's retired now, we're gonna miss him, uh, but he was a visionary and, and, and really uh, moved us forward. Another place we're working is Bolton Branch. Uh, there's a series of projects. This is a, a, a Ford, a low water uh, Ford. Uh, and we're trying to replace places like that with bridges that create a clear span. Um, and the result in terms of the, the quality of the stream is, is much, uh, much improved. 
and it gives us a chance to do uh, terrestrial habitat restoration uh, to create pollinator uh, species along the, along the streams and, and, and create a better habitat in general, uh, but while also improving stream quality. And the results, initial results from, from uh, aquatic habitat uh, field studies are encouraging. Uh, we're seeing uh, improved species quantity and diversity uh, and, and greater mobility between uh, parts of the stream. So I think if we keep, keep doing this over, over a period of time, we'll have great results. It takes a lot of partners, uh, both private and public. And uh, it's, a, it's a great example of the collaborative work that's going on all through, all through the region. And the end result is something like this. You see the park in the background, you see heavily forested uh, riparian corridors flowing down uh, places like the Rapidan River, uh, surrounded by working landscapes that are, are part of that uh, human and natural uh, collaboration. Um, these will get better and, and we will have better results as we go forward. And I wanna leave you with one, uh, one, one image. Uh, this is a collaboration that has survived a lot of stress and strain. This was, this was an event, I think in 2018, where we had a massive thunderstorm during the, we had our entire donor base almost electrocuted. It was kind of terrifying. But I, I want you to know that, that tonight's presentation is an example of the resiliency of our, our organizations, our, commitment to doing this over time and, and, and with the gathering momentum. Uh, we started out as a, a project from donors that wanted to see the three uh, nonprofits collaborate, uh, recognizing that the park was the, the, one of the beneficiaries. Um, it was a, the first event was on a driving rainstorm and the whole thing had to be moved indoors and the volunteers did that in, in, a, in, a, in less than a day and everybody had a great time. Uh, we've had events and storms like this. Uh, last year, we were going to have something at, uh, in a new format called Ridges to Rivers at Oak Hill and in Loudoun County. Uh, COVID interrupted that. And here we are tonight uh, doing this as a virtual presentation. But I hope you take away from this the, the incredible amount of science, the incredible amount of um, partnership and uh, and attention to real consequential results. To think back to those images of the number of families that have worked uh, towards that common goal and the in incredible public-private partnership, just that represents the, the amazing science that SCBI and Virginia Working Landscapes is doing in collaboration with the park and others. And the results that we can get if we just apply some of the ideas that that science produces. Uh, you can contribute to all of our organizations, that's great. You've got wonderful professionals and you've got wonderful volunteers uh, who are very uh, committed to making the best of those resources. You can be a landowner who, who participates. Uh, you can be a volunteer. Uh, you can simply um, enjoy the results. All of those are, are, are worthy. Um, spread the news. Uh, so you can pass on the, the link to this recording and hopefully others will get the benefit of, of seeing these presentations. Uh, but please, please know that this is an ongoing effort and we look forward to sharing the results next year uh, in person, some wonderful venue uh, where you can enjoy uh, the, the benefits of our work together uh, in person. So I think that's, that's the, the last, last uh, formal word and now we'd love to open up for questions and I'm gonna turn it back over to Kendra. So much for that. That was great. Um, we do have a few questions. We're running a little short on time, so we will get to as many as we can. Um, but for our first question, this one is actually for Amy. So we saw this mentioned in one of your slides. How does someone become a citizen scientist? Yeah, so we have a volunteer coordinator. Her name is Erin Sadie. Um, and uh, you can contact her. I, I did have an email up on my ending slide. You can send an email to Virginia Working Landscapes at si.edu, and Erin will touch base with you and give you all the information you need to become a citizen scientist. So thanks for your interest. That's great. Thank you. Um, this one is specifically for Chris. Is there a minimum number of acres required to put a land into a conservation easement? 
The short answer is no. Um, I think it's all driven by the conservation values. What might differ is the, the amount of uh, benefit, tax benefit or financial incentive that you get to participate. There are lots of examples of, of smaller easements in, in Virginia. Um, I personally live in Arlington County, which is pretty urbanized, and there are easements here that are about an acre or less. So the short answer is no. The longer answer is it depends. Um, we're obviously in, in a landscape where, where large tracts are being uh, the focus because we still have an opportunity to conserve hundreds and thousands of acres of land working with one landowner. But if you have something you think you uh, would like to conserve, let us know. We'll try to find the right partner. We may be PEC, it may be someone else, but we, we'll certainly help you try to go through your options. Great, thank you. Um, and this one is for PET. So now that things are starting to open up a little bit more, is the park in expecting any increased visitation? Yeah, actually, we are anticipating 2021 to be a pretty busy year in the park. Um, early indications from the first quarter, uh, we saw, you know, uh, high visitation in January, March, and April, and May. Um, drivers such as reservations for campgrounds and reservations in the lodging are up, uh, so the demand's there. So I was up in the park today, as I mentioned, um, and you know, there's definitely people out in the park. And so I would anticipate uh, seeing a fair number of people as well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's see what our next one is. So Amy, what was the overall goal of the coyote tracking? Like, do we have any um, like time span movements or anything like that that you can share with us? Yeah, sure. So initially, our goal was to, to really get a sense of how coyotes were moving around the SCBI campus. So for those of you not familiar with SCBI, we have a whole collection of endangered species from all over the world um, that are kept on campus and we breed them, you know, to try to preserve the species. And so we were interested to know where the coyotes were moving on center so that we can make sure that any species that could be potential prey are well protected. Um, and what we found is that these coyotes were, were pretty loyal to SCBI, but also really not paying much attention to our collection animals at all. They're doing a lot of hunting in our pastures, our open pastures, um, and spending very little time on central campus uh, where those species are. Our secondary question is just to learn about once they leave center, where are they going and how does that affect their movements? So you probably saw on that one animation that Coyote had pretty small movements around SCBI, but once it left that property, maybe it was facing a lot more threats that made it travel a lot more every day. And so our scientists with the Movement of Life Initiative have the capacity to analyze all of those movements, the timing and locations to figure out what could be affecting how they move where they move and when they spend their where they spend their time. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Um, You're so this one, I'm going to kind of open it up to to all of you. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're working with private owners to restore wildlife habitat? Like, what message, motivators, or incentives are you using? Let me, let I me, can. Um, uh, do you want to go, Chris? No, you don't. <laughs> I guess. I'll, I'll start because we have a somewhat exciting announcement um, together with the Piedmont Environmental Council and American Farmland Trust and, and Quail Forever. Actually, we just received a $25,000 grant um, from the Cornell Land Trust Initiative to reimburse farmers for delayed mowing to help preserve habitat for grassland birds during the haying season. So this is something we're really excited about to kick off in 2022 um, and, and bring together a steering committee to help us define the parameters. But um, that's something that's really current and up and coming that we're excited to work together on. Yeah, I think I would add that, that you know, in, in our interactions with, with landowners, we get a whole series of questions. Um, it really depends a little bit on where their, where their interests lie. But, almost every landowner who's interested in conservation 
is also interested in how they can better manage their land. Um, a lot are interested in invasive species and, and what they can do. We're all partners in the Blue Ridge Prism, uh, which is organizing volunteer efforts to uh, remove invasives from both public and private land. And they have incredible volunteer events and, and organize uh, collective and, and individual landowner work. The other end of the spectrum is, is re replacing it with good native uh, plants and, and habitat. We've got a number of, of folks that are installing those just on their own. We find out about a, after the fact, um, you know, a lot of people like to garden and do their own landscaping. They don't really need a partner to do it with, but there are others that will reach out to us and, and really ask for direction, like what kind of trees to plant and, and where do I, you know, where do I put these kinds of pollinators? So um, it, every every person has got their own interests in, in, in specifics, but in general, landowners are looking for how they can do their part. And, and that's why we're so excited. We're, we're, we're able to increasingly give them a good scientific basis for our, our recommendations. And we're getting better at, at, at getting the uh, material to them at the same time. Thank you. Um, Pat, when will the Tanner's Ridge donation become publicly accessible? <laughs> um, so right now, uh, the land is still currently in the ownership of the trust. We're working through the process to transfer it to the national park. Um, from there, then we would have to develop some planning uh, of how we potentially could access that land. Once it becomes park land, it will be open to the public. Whether we'll develop access or not is a decision yet to be made. I know there will be interest in it. Uh, Naked Creek flows through it. Uh, Naked Creek is a brook trout habitat. Um, and Chris talked about how it's an iconic species here in, the, in Shenandoah. Um, I know that there'll be some anglers definitely looking to get into that stream, uh, but it's a, it's a gorgeous piece of land. Um, and I would just encourage everybody to stay tuned to see what we do uh, as far as public access. Thank you. Um, well, the questions are starting to roll in. I think we have time for about one more. Um, so Chris, regarding stepping up conservation easements, can you comment on the newest Virginia General Assembly statute on conservation easements and the process for interested landowners to establish easements? Well, I, I imagine you're addressing a, 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 an effort that we were part of to clarify the, the way that easements should be interpreted by courts if they're challenged uh, down the road. And that's an important issue, the enforcement of the, of the, the agreements are, are an important part of the process. What the, the statute did was clarify that uh, the court should interpret it to protect the conservation values that are represented. And, and that's a important clarification because the Virginia Supreme Court had uh, followed a long line of precedence and said that the current landowner's interpretation uh, would, would apply if there were ambiguities in, in the language used in the documents. So that's a very technical piece of legislation. Um, I hope it is going to be resolved in the application. Uh, we've worked with the Attorney General's office uh, to, to, to draft, the, draft the language and also uh, come up with a program for uh, enforcement. And I think the Attorney General is, is pretty committed to that, a longtime conservationist. So um, that's, that's the le recent legal change. The, the good news is the General Assembly has recognize partially uh, in response to what Patrick, Patrick uh, identified as the surge in interest in, in open space, uh, both public access and more generally just, you know, getting outdoors. And, and the General Assembly has responded. There's more funding than ever in Virginia to do conservation. Um, the tax incentives remain in place and uh, now's the time. Uh, if you ever, ever thought about doing one an easement on your land, this is the time to do it. There's never been more resources, uh, better legal regime, or more people enthusiastic to help you through that process. So if you have any questions, you know, my staff's ready to, to help you. Uh, just reach out and we will follow through. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, well, we are running a little bit over, so but um, if we didn't get to your question, I have written it down. I will pass that along to our presenters. Hopefully they can follow up with you individually. Um, but with that, I would just like to say thank you to Amy, Chris, and Pat for doing such a great job. Um, and a big thank you to everyone that spent their evening with us.
So as a reminder, we'll be sending an email with the recording of this presentation. So please be on the lookout for that in your inbox in the coming days. Um, and feel free to share it with anyone that you think might be interested in watching it. So thank you all again so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening.